Looks like we are live. We're gonna take a second for people. Oh, people already hopped in. There's already nice. already three hundred people watching. Um, so All we right. so we are gonna be joined by another person. Unfortunately, Gummy Beats just messaged us and said that he is no longer able to join us uh, due to some personal reasons. Uh, so hopefully we'll catch up with him later. Uh, but on the positive side, we do have amp live here joining us we'll we'll wait a second because i know that um it takes a second for the numbers to, to bump up and yeah. you know, come over from the last session um but thank you for joining us I, I really appreciate it thank you for inviting me man my pleasure and it looks like we have brian in here as well let me add him to the stream and make sure everything's okay brian what's up with you hey how you guys doing pretty good up, brian? good good Pretty good. So this is our, obviously this is our first time meeting. We'll do all the intros like during the <laughs> during the. <laughs> uh, but thank you. So it looks like the numbers are starting to tick up a bit. But where I wanted to start, um, you know, before we jump into questions, is really just to you know get an introduction into who you guys are, what your background is, and kind of you know what you guys are doing now. So Amp, if you want to start, you know, with a brief intro, uh, feel free. Yeah. Um, once again, my name is Amp Live, real name Anthony. Um, I basically, I come from more of an artist uh, background. I come from a hip hop group called Zion I. So we started in the Bay Area probably around 2000, 2001. And uh, I'm a music producer. At this point, I'm a music producer artist. So I perform, I put out my own music, that type of thing. But I also am uh, very big in the sync and licensing world. So I got hired as an a r and also a publishing deal with Position Music out here in LA. Uh, that's probably been for about two or three years. So um, my background is mainly production, more on the artist side of things, but um, I'm also, you know, very seasoned in doing sync and licensing and uh, kind of like the admin parts of things also. Dope, dope. I, I, I'm going to have some more questions about that transition from, I'm yeah. assuming you're still making music though, right? You still do it as Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, Brian, you want to do the same thing? Just give us a little, little background on who you are and kind of what you're working on now. Sure. No problem. Um, so I'm Brian Brown. I'm currently at uh, Pulse Music. Um, I work um, <clears throat> on the licensing side. Um, my experience is, um, I kind of hopped all around in this business. Um, I'm originally from uh, the New York area. Uh, so my uh, my intro to the business came in radio. And then um, once I thought that radio was a little too constrictive, I wanted to go to the label side. I had no clue what publishing was or licensing for that fact. Um, like everybody else, everybody wanted to be an A&R. So that's what I wanted to be too. Um, and then I found out about licensing and um, I got uh, started out at EMI and uh, I was at BMG for a little bit and uh, I've been at Pulse and I moved to LA about three years ago. So, you know, I work a lot with um, advertising uh, agencies, TV film studios, video game companies, um, and it's just the grind of uh, placing, negotiating and uh, closing uh, a lot of these sync deals. So it's kind of a, a brief overview and uh, I'm sure we're going to delve into it a little bit more. For sure. For sure. And, be, and before I forget, let's talk about this trend. Cause there's not that many artists, like it doesn't even, I mean, I, and this is my first time meeting you, but a lot of times like artists don't even have your temperament and just kind of your community. It's just, I don't see very many artists like going into a more structured job. How did you like manage that? transition and what made you know what made them kind of how did you develop that skill set you know to try make well that i mean well this is the one thing you know once you when you really do music like it's in your heart so you're really never going to give it up so i i haven't like necessarily transitioned 100 percent because i still perform i still am out there putting mm -hmm. out my music but you know i you know man and Zion and I, man, we really, uh, we had our heyday. And I did the big touring. I, I did the shows, being gone from home all year. And I'm, I'm kind of through with that type of touring. Mm -hmm. So for me, this type of uh, position was just ideal because it kind of keeps me at home, but I can leave when I need to. And uh, 
it allows me to use my experiences that I've learned so far in the music industry and apply it, you know, in a, in a really productive way. So the transition for me personally wasn't that hard. Now I've been doing this for a while. If this was me in the beginning of my career, it would probably be more of a problem because I just wouldn't know what the future was. And, you know, you kind of have your mind set on a certain thing. But at this point in my life, like it was, uh, it was a great move. Right. Dope. And, I, and it probably gives you a unique perspective, like having been an artist. So you're able to communicate yeah. with them and, and, you know, develop some really solid relationships because you have yeah. a, different, a different vantage point. Um, OK, so let's let's jump into sync licensing. Brian, can you just talk like just maybe because there might be some people that don't even know like what we're talking about. Right. Can you just yeah. kind of lay the groundwork, just kind of the basics, kind of what it is? what it is that we're talking about, what it is that, that you do specifically. Okay, cool. So um, from the, you know, I, I talk about it from the publishing side, but it's also relevant with um, the label as well too. But the basic is what synchronization licensing is, is when you take music and it's technically synchronized, right? To the background in, uh, a television show or in a film or in a, a commercial. Um, so that is kind of like the short of it. Um, it and how we get there and, and that whole process, um, we'll get into a little bit further, but on the surface, that's, that's basically what it is. So anytime you're watching whatever it is, your favorite television show, or if you see a movie, um, and you hear that music in there, you know, hence the, the work that went to getting that in there. And there's a lot of moving parts as well, too. But that's it on a surface level. For sure. And I think this is a very yeah. important discussion now for a couple of different reasons. One, um, there's a lot more content being created. And I think there's a lot more need for music. And it's because there's Hulu, there's Amazon, there's Netflix, there's there's uh, network television. There's a lot of music being played. So I think the opportunities have grown exponentially over the past 10 years. Um, and then the second reason being, given that we are currently in a pandemic, you know, and certain revenue streams have been cut off, artists with a more diversified revenue stream, if you had already been getting placements, you already had developed these relationships, you might have been able to weather this storm a little easier as opposed to if you were highly skewed towards touring right so i think it's really yeah. i think it's really important for artists to understand this space to be able to start developing these relationships um so let's talk about that like who who am i developing a relationship with like i know these opportunities are out there amp do you want to start with like like so where do i start if i'm not getting any placements like, where do I start? Who who are these people? What are the titles? Well, I mean, I you know, the honest truth is there's different ways of doing it. You have companies that just do sync and licensing. You have publishing companies who have a strong sync and licensing uh, portion of their company. And you just have personal relationships that you might make yourself with directors or music supervisors, those type of people. So there's different ways you could, you could get in. But I mean, the, the honest truth is, you know, you need to make sure you have your music ready before you even submit music for those relationships. You know, I mean, I think right now is a beautiful time for sync and licensing because there are visuals everywhere, YouTube, like you're saying, Netflix, Hulu, um, just commercials for your phone. It's just, it's so many places. And every single time you see these visuals, you see there's music behind it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. So I kind of think when you're first starting out, man, just shotgun method, like keep your own relationships very dear that you make that have something to do with sync and licensing, hit up publishing companies, hit up sync and licensing companies, hit up libraries, like do it all until you really find something that fits for your workflow. For sure. Do you have any, Brian, you have anything different to add than that? Or does that, that pretty much, much cover it? Yeah, I think, I think AMP covered a lot of, um, a lot of kind of the basics, at least when it comes to getting into, I think it's also just important too, to understand kind of the role that um, everybody, you know, that each entity plays 
Um, um, in terms of the sync agents, you see a lot of them kind of coming into play more. And that's, and that's actually pretty good too, because some people say, well, I, I need a publishing deal or I need a, or I need a label deal in order to get into this space. And you don't. So I just want to clarify a lot of that too. And then really the relationship building, um, there's a lot of independent artists people that don't have major deals that are out there and they're still well, they're, they're well connected to a lot of the supervision community as well. So that was very important to note too. Right. And then Amp, I heard you mention, you know, one, your, your music has to be ready. Like what, like, what does that mean to you? Well, just, I mean, in reality, man, it's like, it's a really busy industry. And with some of these people, you only have a few shots, honestly. So, you know, you need to make sure that you have music that's been mixed and mastered, sounding professional. Like when you compare it to maybe commercial artists or artists that you really respect that, you know, have a lot of recognition for the music, like your music needs to compete, you know? And when it gets to that point, I would kind of then start, you know, sending it out. But you just don't want to send demos. You don't want to send things that really aren't fully ready to represent your brand. Are you because people won't pay attention when they get that email, you know, that third or fourth beat pack that you're sending. They'll be like, okay, I listened to the first one, it wasn't ready. I don't have time to really uh to really deal with this, you know. So right. So you're you're basically saying, like, hey, you're not gonna get that many opportunities, so make sure that what you send is gonna leave a good impression. I, you know, and this is going more toward, because you had said, you know, there's a lot of new artists out there who have been touring who don't know that much about singing licensing. So you might have artists out there that are kind of like, oh man, okay, I got to jump on this, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, this is one of those things where it kind of takes time. Sometimes it doesn't, but most of all, you know, most, most of the time it, it takes time to kind of build things up to really get the right placements and get, get your foot in the door. Right. And I, and I might be jumping all over the place, but one of the things that, that, that you just reminded me of, like my experience of getting placements is like having certain files ready when there is an opportunity, right? The different, yeah. ver the different versions of songs and information. Can you guys talk about like once there is interest in a song, what should they have ready like immediately, ready to, to turn around like ASAP? <laughs> um, well, this is the portion where I'm going to look right into the camera and tell everybody, if you're going to take notes, this is where I want you to take notes. Um, <laughs> from my perspective, okay, and the side of the business that I deal with, which is a little bit more admin focused. Yeah. Um, and you brought up a great point too about don't send in demos. If you're going to send in something, it, it, it's got to be as close to finish, if not the finished product. So you move along, you get interest, great work out your splits make sure all mm. of the admin side of it is is figured out make sure your splits are in order make sure that if you have a co-writer and if they're signed with a publisher or if they're like make sure all the, the everybody has to be accessible the contact info so if it's just like there's a producer that's unknown make sure he's got an email, make sure he's got a cell phone, somebody that can, you know, you need people to be easily accessible because when, like you said, there's not a lot of time. Music supervisors have to move and they have to move quickly. And if there's, you know, things are not in order, they're just going to move on. So that's, that's something that's very important. So I talk about splits, kind of having contact info ready if there are other co-writers, other people that are participating on the song. Um, and then also another part of it too, even if you personally don't have it, make sure that you have access to your instrumentals. Make sure that you have access to um, the different sort of tracks that may be available because they may not be using a vocal part of the scene. And it's just about you. And again, just think about it as if you're running a business, right? You are your entity, you are your brand. So you want to be seen as somebody that's easy to work with, somebody that's always efficient, they respond, and they're giving everybody what they need in a timely manner. So it's just all about having those things, your ducks in a row, making sure it's always accessible. And again, it's not like, it, it, you know, oh, it's not on this computer, but hey, I can go pull it off my, my, my iCloud or something. 
where it's just like you can turn it around quick. So I mean that that that's kind of like the one of the more foundational pieces of advice I can give today. Can, can I piggyback on some of the uh, Brian brought up? Mm -hmm, for sure. First and foremost, at, at, um, to add on to the second thing you said, Brian, stems. Stems mm -hmm. is big because a lot of times yeah. these editors are taking the music and rearranging mm -hmm. it themselves to fit the scene, especially when you deal with more trailers and that type of stuff. So that's something that I recently have just come across seeing like way more important and urgent, you know, having those stems ready to go. Um, especially if you're an artist who might have ownership, you might have the masters, but the producer is Lord knows where. It might take a while to get that stem as you're needed. So I think that's really important to like try to get as soon as possible stems for the track. But going back to what you were first talking about, Brian, with co-writes and making sure everybody signed off, this is a big collab culture right now. And I think when you're young, you know, you don't kind of realize the business end of things. Like you're not kind of looking at the long picture. So you're in the moment, you're vibing in the studio, you know, just making stuff and just getting it hot. But what people need to realize is whoever has had input on that song could claim a copyright to it. So whether or not, you know, they added the snare, they said, this is tight, you should add this, this, and this, they could be part of that copyright if you don't discuss all of this after the track is through. So it's really right. important that you really not only realize who you're making music with, but it's very clear like who's got the right percentages because somebody could have 1%, just 1%, they added a shaker to the song and they could hold up the biggest sync that you've ever gotten, you know, because they don't want to sign off, you know? So it's, uh, it's really important that you kind of take care of that business. I mean, maybe after the creativity is done, but you just make sure, you know, that you, uh, sooner than later, you, you really take care of like, who's going to have a percentage of what. So, so super important to have the paperwork done to have, I think artists should just get in the habit of, you know, cutting all the different versions, the clean version, yeah. acapella, uh show versions regular versions like you should have all those versions and keep them organized because and you guys can i think brian already spoke to it like this some sometimes these opportunities come or go yeah. very go very fast like they'll switch your song out with the quickness if or at least that's been my experience and you guys can talk about it um you know if well, we've always had stuff ready to go. I've seen other people like lose out on opportunities because they just weren't quick enough. They didn't. They weren't organized. Have you guys seen that too? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you got like one yeah. day, maybe two days at the most. Yeah, you no. Know? Yeah. But I, but I also think this is a place where independent artists can really excel, maybe over some bigger artists because like mm -hmm. a lot of the bigger songs, there's so many people involved now. Where I've seen you know, companies like to work with independent artists because it, if you're organized, it's less of a hassle. Do you guys think independent artists could have a leg up if they have their house in order? Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And, then, and I think it goes back to, to what I said earlier too about that being your brand as well. Mm -hmm. Like you want to be that artist that's, that's accessible, that, hey, I know if I could go to X, Y, and Z, I have no problem. Everything's going to be in order. Hey, I'm looking for this. And I know they're going to hit my briefs with everything I'm looking for creatively. They got all their shit, excuse my language. They got all their stuff in order and everything is going to move smoothly. And I think that's also a big part of it too. Just understanding that the job of the supervisor, they're getting thousands, tens of thousands of submissions a day. So again, it's all about trying to figure out what makes you stand out. And not just creatively, for sure. Can can you guys talk about like at your res in your respective positions, like uh, like uh, should people be sending their music to you? Like, how do you guys work, or do you work with just artists that are signed to your companies? Like, how do how do your individual companies work, like just on a day to day, um, in terms of potential new artists or the artists you work with? Well, in position, we have a couple of branches. We have the A and R component, which is what I'm part of. You know, a &Rs are responsible for finding new talent, collecting new talent, making sure that uh, whatever artist you are representing um, has all their stuff in order and they have the right songs to work. So you're kind of 
I'm kind of more on the creative end of things, you know. Um, and then we have an admin department, which I think that's what Brian said he was part of. And they they take care of more of the business side of things, the rates, making sure that, you know, all the paperwork and all the business side of uh, these tracks is taken care of before they're totally confirmed. Um, and then you kind of have a sales department in a way, like people who have the relationships with the music supervisors, people who have relationships with directors and uh, different sync houses that are actually like getting the briefs in and, um, you know, kind of like, uh, I guess, figuring out like what particular type of music, what, what particular uh, sounds, that type of thing might fit best with these briefs, you know, and it all kind of comes together like this machine that just works really uh, well and consistently. So you're, so you're, so are you constantly looking for artists or producers? Do you look, uh, so are there some producers that you, I'm assuming that you, you work with just producers sometimes. And then sometimes, or when you say artists, are you just collect sometimes? Yeah, man, okay. producers, writers, artists, like, you know, if you could write and produce your own stuff, then you, you're looking at like a hundred percent of the pie. So, you know, we're always looking for, for everything. Right now though, like producers is really big because, you know, sync, sync is really track driven. Mm -hmm. And so uh, always looking for producers. That's, that's pretty much number one on the list. And then, and then uh, Brian, before you answer, like, is this an, an exclusive relationship with position? Like, are you signed to position or are these like non-exclusive opportunity, like sync opportunities? Is that to me or to, to Brian? Yeah, to you, Amp. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, we definitely have traditional publishing deals, which are more exclusive. But for position, our sync deals are mainly non-exclusive. So the songs that you submit that we uh, that we put out, those are the only ones that we're really doing business with you. Uh, gotcha. With everything else, everything else you can take and do whatever you want to with. Okay, cool. So, so Brian, and, and how, how, what's the process or, or how are you working with artists on a day-to-day, -day, Brian? Um, so Pulse kind of, Pulse operates as, uh, well, they're an independent um, publisher. Um, so the creative department is sort of, you know, that uh, it's more of a creative driven company. Um, and I do a lot of the admin side of it, but they have a, a and r staff and they're looking at songwriters producers um more for kind of um they work with a and r's at the labels because they're pitching songs for uh cuts for label artists um on our side we also have a team of uh creatives that are working with soups they're the ones that are getting the briefs and they're pitching what's in the pulse catalog um for uh sync use so um in terms of kind of like historically the way that the company was built out um i was brought in because there was a it used to be a part of a company called hitcher so hitcher used to represent that that they were a sync agent so we used to just work exclusively with sync with independent artists as well as pulses um roster but then we actually became Pulse, so we stopped repping independently, and now we're only exclusively working with um, Pulse, you know what I mean? So now we're, it's just like, it's all one big company now. Um, but in terms of like sync agents, there's still quite a few that are out there that do operate like that. So you can sign non-exclusive deals. Right. And it's more kind of like, okay, we go out, we get your sync, and we take a cut. You know what I mean? We'll take 20, 25% and then you walk with your 75. Right. And that, yeah. So speaking of that, there are, I've, I've seen a lot of situations where they've taken up to 50%. Um, the, what can like on an, like on a, like a one-off deal, like what, what are the percentage splits that you've seen? Is it, is 25 normal? Is 50 normal? Like from what you've seen? Now, see, I, I said too much. Now you're going to make me mess up somebody's paper out there. So I'm not yeah, trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> nah. I don't know if I was going to say, yo, man, they're charging me 50. What uh, no, because we, I mean, I worked with a couple companies and they were, they were, they, they charged 50. And it was like, 
I was mad, but I couldn't get too mad because it was like they weren't like the opportunity wasn't coming to us otherwise. Right. So it was well, like, I mean that that's the thing. I mean, it's a this is the thing about it, and you always have to remember this. It's a business and we all work together, right? You don't right. want to get jerked. Like nobody ever wants to get jerked, and most companies don't want to jerk people because it comes back to you. Right. But right. if you aren't gonna get the opportunity unless you mess with this company or you have less chances, then it's kind of worth the sacrifice. Right. You know, especially with sync and licensing, because one song could get 20 syncs. You don't know how many syncs it's gonna get. Right. So you're gonna cut this off over like a small minute percentage. Like it's it's not that smart to like really think about it like that. You know, so right. to me, even though the 25 to 50 sounds big, like in the big scheme of things, it might not be as big as you think, you know, especially if you have a song that's getting $50,000 $50, sync here, $20,000 sync here, a hundred, you know, it's like pretty right. soon you're gonna be like, I'm, I'm making money, you know? So yeah. not that that's how I felt. I mean, at first, you know, 50 for percent, you know, just by, it just sounds like a big number. It's like, wow, like half, but, but like you said, when you think about it, these opportunities weren't coming in anyway. Um, I'd like you to lower that percentage, but damn, this is money that I'm not using any extra energy or effort to bring in. You know, it's just music being exposed on other platforms and, and generating a, another um, revenue stream. Um, can can we talk? Let's take a step back and like talk about how the money breaks down for a sync placement. Like, let's just say that there's a new, you know, Avenger film that comes out and they want to place you know, one of your songs in that movie. Can one of you guys talk about like, and let's just say it, it's 50,000, you know, like, can we talk about like how that, how that breaks down? And who, who's um, all that? And I don't know if you actually, um, I don't know. Like, have you jumped in on negotiations on that side or not? I, I don't right, know. Right, right. Everybody, I, mean, I have. Well, no, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, everybody's got like their, their methodology. So I was just curious about like how you would even go about it. Like what well, things okay. do you I'll, factor in? I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about it more from the artist side of things. Cause I've gotten syncs as an artist and I still do. Right. What's so cool about sync and licensing is that you get paid in more than one way. You get paid a sync fee, which means it's the initial fee that you get for the actual sync. So you get a song in Avengers movie, they pay you like, 20,000, 50,000 up front, right? Then you get paid for your publishing royalties. So every single time that song is played in the Avengers movie, you get paid from that, just like radio, anything else, right? And then mm -hmm. on top of that, and this, this is what changes from company to company, you actually get a demo fee for turning in the song. And that may vary from $1,000 to $250, you know, it, it just matters. So, you know, it one song could really just spark a lot of income for you if it's the right song, you know? And that's why to me, doing this is so important because if you have a whole album and you have three or four of these syncable songs on it, I mean, that could pay for your whole campaign. I personally have had that happen where I've recouped just off of one song syncing. So now all the royalties I'm getting from sales, shows, all that is coming right to my pocket and not being recouped anymore, you know? And then so so when it so if so if a, a sync placement is is, is ten thousand, so let's just say, you know, so it's ten thousand on the publishing side and then typically the same amount on the master side, right? If you own both the publishing and the master yeah. music. Yeah. Um, M F yeah, MFN clause, most favored nations ensures that um you're gonna get the same on both sides um right. now there there's instances where you can drop it or or it is dropped for instance like rare rare instance let's say you want to go back and and cover a rolling stone song well mm -hmm. the publishing for the rolling stones <laughs> they come in <laughs> at a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and no disrespect to any you know but a company is not going to pay you one hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you're going to cover that song. So I mean, in those instances, you would probably have to just scale back, and you'll you'll get something. You know what I mean? But they could drop the MFM. But yes, that in in perfect world scenario, 
you you'll get the same on one side as you get from the other. Yeah. Got you. Okay. So we have let's let's drop it down to ten thousand. So ten thousand on the master side, ten thousand on the publishing side, and then additional publishing royalties that get earned as it gets played publicly. Um, yeah. and sometimes a demo fee. So is the demo fee only for a song that was created like just for that? just for that particular movie or can a demo fee sometimes be earned just by submitting a song? It, you know, that depends. I've done, you know, before I was in a position, I've worked with some companies and that you would get a demo fee for just turning in the song. But mainly you would think that once the song is accepted, you do get the demo fee. The biggest thing that you have to remember though, that's a loan. So I brought that up just so, you know, you just, you won't be handing out your music and feeling like you're just not getting compensated. I think that's why they do the demo fee. So you'll at least have something, but they will, it's recoupable. So, you know, you have to remember that. So if you get a $3,000 demo fee, that's coming out of, you know, your, your sink once the money rolls in. So, you know, it's up to you whether you want to take it. Okay. Like that. No, that's new to me because I don't think we've ever dealt with a, a demo fee before. Um, so that's interesting. The, the amp, one thing you mentioned, you said, you know, if you cut an album and four of them are syncable, that made me that made me want to ask the question, like, what are there qualities of a syncable song? Like, like, should, is yeah. there <laughs> ways that artists should be making music if this is what they want to do? Like, what? It's it. You know, it, it's. This is a good platform to talk about this because out of all the platforms, I think hip hop is probably having the toughest time with this transition. This is the thing about it. you have different types of syncs. You know, if you get your song synced in the, the Transformers trailer, that's going to be a way different money than if you get your song synced on like Empire during like a fight scene or something like that, you know, yeah. and it's different types of music. So it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I think, especially for hip hop, you, for you to score big, like the, the, the big, big stuff, you have to have your music sounding and formatted uh, a certain way for it to really be impactful. Because the reason, and again, you have to remember, this is what sync and licensing is about. That track has to support the visual. It, it has nothing to do with it being banging in the club, it has nothing to do with how innovative it is. It has it has to fit the visual. That's why they are paying for it, and that's why they want it. So sometimes those type of songs aren't as appealing commercially, you know. And when you're looking at trailers and things that have a lot of transitions, changes, a lot of action, you know, those songs are going to have different types of movements. I mean, overall, I would like to say, like, if you if you listen to like maybe Kanye, beautiful uh, dark twist of fantasy, like that type of production works really well, you know, because it's, dy it's dynamic, it has a lot of changes, it's musical, but then the drums are really big, hard. Like that type of style works really well for most things. Now, a lot of the modern music, you know, and we're going more into a trap era, that type of thing, it still works but you're looking at a certain type of sync that you'll get for most of that music because the editor can't do that that much with a beat that stays consistent you know right and it's you know it's it's kind of hard for hip hop producers to really embrace this but it's just it's kind of just the reality right now like your music is supporting a visual so if you just got a beat just running straight no matter how hot it is um you know it might not get the big sync placements that you that you want you know a lot of people are like yeah i want to do sync and licensing i want to see my stuff on the movies this and this but they're making music that doesn't necessarily fit that type of uh that that type of sound you know right right so if so given that there's different types of of like um uh, deals, whether it's non-exclusive or exclusive, like, would you, and I know that it's going to depend on, you know, the quality of, of the company, but just exclusive versus non-exclusive. Like, is it, do you have a feeling one way or another, whether an artist or a producer should develop an exclusive relationship with a sync house or should they try to plant as many seeds as possible and develop as many relationships as possible? What are the kind of the pros and cons? 
I mean, I still think that you can develop those relationships, but I think with the exclusive, right, everybody wants to have a home, right? They want a place that they can call home. Um, I mean, that really does kind of depend on you. Like, are you happy with the checks that you're getting from one place versus the other? Um, so I think it really just comes down to what personally works for you as an artist. You know, as some as some artists, and and listen, you can you can get creative too. You can there's some rules that you can play by as well. You can sit there and say, well, look, I like how X company handles business, and they do really well with this stuff. So I'm going to give them my top stuff. But this other company here, they still they still getting me some work. I just may throw them some some of the other tracks that like uh, this has just been sitting there. And I may just yeah. want to give it to them to kind of let it work a little bit. So you can be strategic yourself too from that standpoint as well, if you want to play it like that. But I think, I personally think having the exclusive, because again, if you, most times that does indicate that you probably have a dedicated team um, kind of working with you. Um, so I think having those resources built in is great. That those services that they can provide seem to, you know, and like I said, when you're in-house and just knowing that you have, you know, hey, I'm going to call my sync person over here. I got this great track. I want them to listen to it. I just think it even helps with it, having that access. Got you. And I guess the, the last thing you want, like even if you have, you know, non-exclusive agreements with places, the last thing you want is a couple of different companies like pitching the same songs. Like don't get messy. Yeah, you definitely don't want that. Um, have you have you seen that happen, Amp? Can you can you talk a little bit? Uh, about only that? a few producers have gotten away with that, but overall, companies definitely don't want that, and you'll burn some relationships if uh, if that happens too much. So you definitely don't want that, you know. For sure. Do Do you guys work with any artists that only produce music for like? Sing? I mean, they might produce. Well, yeah. Like, so you guys do have some some clients that yeah. only and. That's right. are, are they submitting stuff prior to their being like, um, I guess you call it a brief. So you get briefs on, on what they're looking for and then they create it or do they already have stuff that's yeah. created? And Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a little uh, bit of both, right? Uh, go ahead, Brian. A little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I like, mean, you know, yeah. we at position, we work really, really closely with the artists and producers and writers that are part of the family you know so we will dig in and collect information really look at what themes what what sounds what type of music is working and we'll kind of put that vibe out there and see what we get back you know so i don't know i think when you're chasing briefs it's really hard to actually land them because most of the time these music uh directors and and the you know the people that are behind the brief are submitting the music they they kind of want the references that they're giving you, but then they don't want them, you know? So if you're constantly chasing that, it's just gonna be hard really nailing it versus just having something that's fresh that you can apply in many other places besides this one brief, you know? So I think like when you just have music that's in the overall direction of many briefs, you'll have more chances of, of landing something, you know? So the good, the good producers are producing ahead of time and just have things kind of ready to go to kind of fit uh, the narrative that's, that's being sent. Got you. Now, so I, are there any specific, like, just stories, whether, like, extremely good stories or bad stories that, like, stand out that can be teachable moments for artists or producers that are that want to develop relationships and get these opportunities i know this is kind of i know you probably have tons of stories but is there anything and obviously leave names out uh but is there anything <laughs> but is, is there is there, are there any stories that that do stand out that, that could provide a a teachable moment you know that that you guys have worked on brian you got one <laughs> I, I may have to I may have to think about that one for a little bit. I mean, well, in terms of a positive story, and kind of going back to you know whether it should be exclusive, non-exclusive, or whatever, um, publishing companies. And again, you brought this up earlier. The landscape really kind of provides 
this opportunity now for people to get innovative and, and think about ways that they could even increase um, exposure. So one thing that my company does, um, um, you know, our head of creative, she does a really fantastic job. She's, she's built this phenomenal relationship with, um, with the folks over at stars. And then she conducted this whole sync camp. So again, it gave an opportunity for some of our writers in house and then also outside writers that they have good relationships with, but when we're not technically repping to bring them in and it gave them an opportunity to sit in a meeting with the showrunner, with the music supervisor of the show. And they're given the creative direction. They're feeding the creative direction to all these music creators in the room. And it's like, hey, yeah, we're trying to do a scene where X character walks in and then this is happening. So fill that out for me. So I think that's a pretty good success, success story right there where it's kind of like where everybody wins. So the company now, you know, the, the studio and the show now have basically their music vision filled out. The company, the publisher now has now created an opportunity to now generate more syncs. And then now it's getting other writers in the room. So now they have the opportunity to now also get that experience firsthand. What's it like to actually sit there and have these conversations with the music supervisors, with the showrunners. So you're talking about the executive producers of the show. So, I mean, that type of exposure, those sorts of things, that that's, I'd say that's a pretty successful story. I want to kind of stay on the positive. Don't, there's too many negatives that we could pull for sure. I, I, can, I can say a few negatives. You can, you can say it positive. <laughs> negative. I'm sure you're going to hear this. You're going to be like, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing, and again, I'm glad we're on this platform, <clears throat> is uh there could be some big negatives when you deal with samples. Mm. Um, uncleared ones. <laughs> uncleared samples. And in 2020, yeah. you actually have no excuse to have that, honestly, like Splice and all this other stuff around. <clears throat> but uh, if you don't have a sample cleared, I don't care what, it could be something like this small, like, and you don't bring it up to the publisher or the licensing company, whoever is representing this check, it could have a ripple effect that's huge, you know? <clears throat> so you have to make sure that you are upfront and honest about samples that you've used in your track. If you've taken a sample and you replayed it, and it's not that much different than the original, you could still get in trouble for that, you know? And we, you know, that happens every once in a while, but uh, your song will get snatched, you know? And there will, there might be a lawsuit that, that goes mm -hmm. along with that. And it's like, it's all gonna trickle down to you. And once you're that artist or producer who who gave an uncleared song to a company and they got sued, like nobody's really gonna, the people are gonna think twice before working right, uh, right. with you again. So I would just say, really, really be careful about that. There, There's so many different ways you can get around doing music and not using samples. You could create your own samples. You could buy samples from other people who create samples, uh, you know, but you wanna make sure that you are using music that has been cleared, it's royalty free. There are no, you know, no strings attached to it. I, I guess related to that, um, you know, obviously BeatStars is a great platform. Leasing beats is a, is a, is a great thing for, for most artists. However, when it comes to syncs, because the sometimes ownership is a little bit confusing and like if I just leased a beat from BeatStars, I made a song and now there's an opportunity to get it in a new film. Like what is that process? Have you guys dealt with, with like a song with a leased beat? Like what is that, what needs to happen in order to take advantage of that opportunity? Um. I mean, I haven't personally dealt with it, but we have had a few instances uh, trying to clear that up and it, it, it becomes a headache. Uh, it depends on how many times that beat was leased and uh, just who has it. Honestly, I can't speak too too much on it because it was more on the, uh, the admin side of things, mm -hmm. but I do know, I mean, just in thinking about it, it is, it's gonna be problems if you know this beat is out there in different types of ways and then all of a sudden, you know, it's being used for something totally different. You got you. Brian, have you had that experience with it, with it, maybe a song that, that used a, a beat that was leased? Um, no, not really. 
I, I haven't run into too many of that um, as well. But a caveat of that too, um, creatively, when you know, like when you go down that avenue, it can get stale and quick. So sometimes it's like that's why you just gotta, you know, be mindful of that and just know which ones are being used and like recycling sometimes too soon amongst like can kind of yeah. put you out on the outs creatively. Right. Yeah, I would, uh, you know, if I was a producer, I would do maybe a variation of that beat that I wanted to submit for sync, if anything, you know. I mean, having stuff that's just easy, just really accessible, again, makes it easier for everybody else. Therefore, people want to continue to work with you. You know, so you kind of, it might be a little bit more work on the back end, but for the future, it might put you in a way better place. You know, so <clears throat> that's kind of the way I would approach it, honestly. Got you. So th how important is it that a track has already performed well? Does that make it easier for you guys to place it? Like if you go to Spotify and it's got, you know, 50 million streams already, does that play in at all? Like how do you guys pitch music or does it not I mean, matter? it depends on who wants that song you know sometimes i mean if it's like apple music or something they might want the new hot song so yeah. when they see that they're like oh yeah we want this because there's a fan base mm -hmm. in place it's getting heat this is going to represent this new product and sometimes they want something that's totally unreleased because they want it to be like something super brand new and like we're the ones who are putting the song on the map you know or you know it's way easily uh, clearable because it doesn't have all this traction you know, so I think like it kind of just matters, you know, what's, what's, who wants it. Right. Yeah. I that. think, yeah, you, you, you hit on it. A big part of it is uh supervisor ego. They want to be the ones who say, I broke this. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah, some, of it, yeah. so, some of it sometimes is, is that. So it's like, you yeah. know, you, if you have a following, fine, but, you know, um, sometimes it, you could be under the radar and, you know, it's just about they they'll just hear it by chance and say like that's the one that's the one i want to hear i mean i will say this from my experiences the big 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 money is going mm -hmm. after those artists that already have a fan base because you're kind right. of paying for that right so that you know it's not that those type of songs don't get you know picked it's just like it's just a different mentality going behind it you know mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, and record. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to wrap up yeah. another point too, because it tied into something you had mentioned too earlier. Um, advertising specifically is more. Again, they have thirty to sixty seconds to sell you that product, so mm -hmm. they need something that's recognizable. That's why a lot of the times in advertising, you're going to hear recognizable hits, and it's driven by lyrics. Whereas trailer, film, television can be driven by mood when you have that build up. Advertising is really about nailing the lyric. And if you have a hook that stands out, those are the things that are gonna make it, you know, it's gonna catch people's ears. That's why you hear a lot of the times, a lot of these Motown songs are always, you know, because it's a part of America's storybook. So it brings out those feelings and nostalgia and all that. So when you're watching a Clorox commercial, that's why you're gonna hear the temptation because it's all about identity and it's about trying to make you just latch on to it and identify as quickly as possible. So, I mean, some of that too, just so you know, it's not about it not being, uh, it's not just because it's not good, but sometimes the spot, they're just calling for recognizable. They want something yeah. that, that a lot of people are going to know, or they're going to want something decade specific. So it's just a lot of the times is how these opportunities come to be. Got you. So, and I, and I know that, you know, primarily these opportunities, you know, you, you, you get the check. We talked about how, you know, the, the, the revenue opportunities from them, but also, you know, depending on the placement it could just be a great link, a great look for the song. It could, could lead to a lot more streams, yeah. a lot more visibility of your brand. How often do you, do you see that? Um, and where do those, where, where are the placements that typically have that residual effect on just the song itself and maybe the artist's popularity? You see that all the time, man. You get your stuff. I mean, imagine if, 
you know, especially with Shazam, like that's the big thing that kind of changed the game. But if you have your song at the right scene, people are gonna hear it and they're gonna be like, oh man, what what is that song immediately? You know, with commercials and stuff, you just happen to be watching a commercial, you really like the track, you can Shazam it really fast. Like syncs have definitely made artists' careers financially and fan wise. You know, you definitely see an uptick in fan interaction, streams, all that when you get certain syncs. You know, I I would, you know, at this point, I would definitely want to add that to my to my overall uh, brand and, and umbrella when putting out music because it could be a game changer. You know, there's definitely been songs that you've seen on like this new Apple laptop or something that blow up and then all of a sudden you hear it on the radio. For sure. Um, and then last question before I open it up uh, for questions from the audience. And um, I know there's a lot going on in the comments section. I'm going to try to pick out questions. I know there's some people that are just talking back and forth and that's fine. I'm not going to tell you to stop, but it makes it harder to see some of the questions. Uh, so I'm going to ask one last question and then I'm going to try to find some some quality questions in the comment section. So please just post your your no matter what platform, if, if you're on Periscope or YouTube or Facebook, I'll, I'll be able to see the questions that come into the comments. So uh, put, put your questions there. Um, I guess the last thing I will ask is, is, you know, how how do artists get in touch with you or do are you where are you actively looking for new talent? I mean, I'm sure that's going to be, you know, on the top of everybody's minds. Like, how do I get in touch? How do I get, you know, build a relationship with you guys if possible? I mean, man, you can just email me amp at positionmusic.com. We're sure? constantly I, I wasn't expecting you to throw an email out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey man, you just you gotta take advantage of the time. Uh, now, nah, but we're we're constantly uh on Instagram, Spotify, like you know, we're always looking, you know, and that that's part of it. I you know, I have my my network of managers and other artists I work with, they're always hitting me up, giving me tracks, that type of thing. And the beautiful thing about what I do is, I mean, I send my own music also. So it's like, I'm, I'm constantly giving my music too. So, you know, that's, that's the A&R's job is to find new talent. So that's what I'm constantly doing is out there looking, you know? Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, and I mean, um, as far as like, with Pulse being kind of like a, uh, operating as a publisher it's it's a little bit of a harder position because they just they don't take unsolicited music and you'll find that with a lot of the uh other companies so um you know i think the best way to really probably you know really get through is just like amp said you gotta just build those relationships with the a and r's and um if you are just starting out as an independent artist and you feel like you're at the point now like managers and attorneys. And attorneys are another one that a lot of people don't ever talk about, but attorneys make a lot of things happen behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And attorneys, uh, and if you see how some of them are actually operating and you see their client list and you're like, oh wow, now it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the attorneys are also the ones too that, are, you know, when, when there's mutual interest in an artist or a writer, the attorneys are the ones that are now taking the lead on the negotiations on the deal. So they're the ones that are hammering a lot. They're well connected. They know a lot of things as well, too. So build out that network and, and, and meet managers, meet attorneys. Um, and those are the folks that you got to just start kind of picking their brain. And, you know, at least, um, you know, I like to make myself available to people. If you have questions regarding licensing and saying like, hey, you know, such and such hit me up what's your take on it? Does this seem good? Is, it, is this not good? Like what, it, you know, so those things like, you know, definitely here to support in that way, because I know sync can be really overwhelming for a lot of people mm -hmm. because a lot of people um, aren't really sure about the ins and outs. So, I mean, I definitely want to be here and I want to support the community um, and definitely, you know, help again, people get to that next level with their music. And let me piggyback off of something that Brian um, had mentioned. This is kind of off topic, but it's not, you know, this is the reason why you hear, especially some of these really big celebrities talk about where most of their money goes to the lawyers, because you kind of get what you pay for. And it's like, I hear people complaining about lawyer fees, 
but you get yourself an expensive lawyer, you're also getting the expensive contacts they have and exactly what Brian's saying. You know, so it's it's an investment, but you're you're also opening up your team to bigger options, you know. Um, so it's just another way of looking in, into it, but attorneys are extremely important. So I'm glad Brian brought that up because yeah. it's 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 a big deal. Right. It's your money, so you want to keep it. You want right. to keep it, but yeah, they. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I I think just in general, and I and I'm so I I I, I work within music, but I also manage some comedians now too. But and I think it's just natural it's coming up as an independent artist, no matter what you're doing, it's it's harder to pay for things that you've never paid for before. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, and it's harder to under, I'm, I'm literally going through that right now, trying to get them to understand yeah. the importance of a business manager and like why we need a good business. You can't just have anybody be your business manager. You can't just have anybody be your lawyer and we have to pay for good ones. Um, so I think that's just the process that all artists go through as they get, yeah. get bigger and get more momentum. Um, all right, cool. Let me, let me pick some questions. Uh, let's see. As a music producer, is it best to be your own publisher? Uh, yeah, definitely at first, you know? I mean, you, you kind of want to take things in strides. Like, you know, a publisher not only helps admin your music, but they also help make it bigger. They put it in di different places and they, you know, they really expand, uh, the, the amount of people you could touch with their music, but you have to be able to deal with that type of pressure. Like you need to be making a lot of tracks that they can use and giving them the gasoline that they need to, to make you money and make them money. So starting out, you know, you may not be at that point, like you may make some hot songs, but it may be inconsistent. So definitely, yeah. Stay with your own publishing, learn the game, learn yourself, learn your brand. And you know, when, you'll know when the time is right for you to sign a publishing deal and, and to work with a publisher, but definitely uh, stay self-published as long as possible until you have the, the right situation. So, so that question had like, I guess they paid something on YouTube. So you don't have to pay for it. It did stand out. And I felt bad. Like somebody paid $5, uh, I guess through YouTube. Um, Cause I know they have like super chat function, but you don't need to pay money to, to, to ask a question, but that one did stand out. So that's why. No. That's, that's, free jewelry, only free jewelry here. <laughs> that's why, that's why I picked that one. <laughs> we'll get Abe to donate that to something. I don't know, uh, <laughs> it's a free platform. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's a good one. Uh, what should the email consist of when reaching out to A&Rs? Uh, well, First of all, um, we kind of didn't hit this, but like, hopefully you'll have a website and some kind of social media presence so we could check you out. You definitely uh, need to have a link with your music. Don't attach MP3s or anything like that because it clouds up uh, our inbox. And uh, yeah, just keep the email short and brief. And it's music first. That's what we want, you know. Um, but you just look bigger if you have a social media presence and, you know, you make yourself like look, look cool and professional. Yeah. I, I would also add to any email, be professional, spell words correctly, <laughs> yeah. uh, use the right capitalization of letters and, you know, try to be as, try to stand out, but nothing too lengthy. Right. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. so you want to try to get straight to the point in all your, especially when you're reaching out cold to people like you want yeah. to get straight to the point. Um, you know, so even to this day, I still reread like some of my, depending on who I'm sending an email to, I might reread it, you know, a few different times. Cause I'll yeah. be, I'll be wordy in the first version. And I'll be like, Oh, I could have cut at least five words out of that sentence and just, yeah. you know, shorten right. things down. Um, all right, let's see. This question, he says, if you submit a beat containing a producer tag for a sync brief, will they take the time to contact you back and ask for the untagged version to proceed, or will they just dismiss that beat and move on to someone else? Does a tag ever matter, like a producer tag? In, in... Brian, did you want to answer this, or you want me to answer this? Well, help me out with producer tag. So, like, uh, Go ahead. Like the, the something that the producer says in front of every... <clears throat> 
Oh, then, oh, oh. Um, take heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to err on the side of saying, you know, just have a version with and without tags just because, again, sometimes the scene may call just for something minimal and they may like the beat and they just may want it for the beat. You know, they don't want everything else that comes with it, you know. Um, I don't know if you had anything else to add on. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to go a little bit more harder. Uh, don't put mm -hmm. the tag in. They okay. will ask you to remove <laughs> the tag. Like, when have you ever saw, like, any Target commercial or anything like that with the producer <laughs> tag? Yeah, it's like, you, you got to take it out. Um, it will not disqualify you, though, but they're going to ask you, can you give us the beat without the tag? I think tags have been around long enough where people know that they're there, but uh, you will have to remove it. So just don't fight it when they ask you to remove it. That's when there'll be a problem. They'll be like, okay, we can't use it. But yes, right. do not do not put your producer tag uh, in, in the beat. Yeah, they're, they're not paying for you. Like, unless you are the subject of the- That's place. the thing. <laughs> it, um, it's, it's hard, man, because like, you're like, oh man, my track is gonna be in this scene in this huge movie coming out. You watch the movie and you can barely hear the track. I mean, you got paid like $30,000. You can't hear the track or anything. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it. This is right. why I accept paper deal, you know? So it's like. Cool. All right, let's see. How many, link, how many links to tracks do you need when, con how, many, how many is too many? If somebody was sending you music, you know, how many, tracks is, is too many. Well, what's the right number? I would say send me your top five and then we'll ask yeah. for more. You know, if there's something there, don't send a beat pack of 20 or 30 beats unless we ask for it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just send the hot stuff, get it straight to the point. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I wish we had time to actually dive into like, cause I'm a producer, so it's easy for me to talk about, but like even how to format your track to make sure it's attractive. But, uh, yeah, just keep keep the hot stuff up top, and uh, you know that that's what we want to hear first. Yeah, yeah. I think five is a good number. Five. Yeah. yeah. And I I know neither one of you represent a company like this, but there are companies that like anybody could submit. Like they have these briefs, and off top, I'm I'm Song Trader, maybe like something like that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of any success like via those platforms, like just those self service? kind of submit your your track like no uh, not many and again i don't it's not about trying to openly discourage um yeah and and, and look i'm not i'm not here to to, to tarnish other people's reputation as companies but yeah i think sometimes i think you know to them it, it's just the more content that they have it, i think they're the one that benefits because yeah. it's, it's, it's almost like, I don't want to drop the word Ponzi scheme, -ish, but think about it like this. If I'm like, I'm sitting, like my library's got 20,000 tracks. You're going to be like, I want to get one because you got 20,000 tracks. So you just gave me 5,000 of your track. So now I'm going to you and I'm telling you, I got 25,000 tracks in this library. So now I'm sitting on 25. So now I'm getting it. So I'm like, I'm getting the next person. So I'm just building and building and building. But at the end of the day, no one's really reaping the benefits of being in this place with all these tracks except for me right so i mean that's kind of like i don't i mean well yeah and also that's where i, I mean, kind of like make the analogy in a sense yeah it's like if you think about it you know you have somebody who wants this they have a brief that they that they need a certain type of song to fit somebody's got to go through all these tracks to submit right. these songs like you're not going to give you know, the company's a list of 5,000 songs for them to listen to for it to fit the scene and confirm that they want the track. You're gonna send them like maybe a playlist of 10, something like that, you know, like you're gonna cut it down. So if you are a company and you have 20,000, 25,000 tracks, it's like the chances of your, your track that you submitted fitting, you know, in that playlist or whatever that's being sent out, it's just gonna be slim. Like there has to be, some type of development and some type of funnel 
to get the hot stuff. You know, if anybody could submit, I could just have been making beats yesterday and be submitting my first beat. I could be submitting 20 of those beats and at the same time as you, you know? So right. mm -hmm. I again, I don't want to trash companies either, but you just kind of have to think about it, you know? Yeah. To think about if it really works. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that, that a placement, you know, placements get landed, you know, every once in a while doing that. But I think if nothing less, like if you're using something like song and I, man, I know of like four or five others, but my, my mind's drawing a blank right now. If you're, <laughs> if you're going through that, pro like, I think at the very least, you're learning what is required in the process, right? Yeah. So if you're like super new, if you're like super new and you're using one of these, like these self-service platforms, like they're still, they're still putting, I think like they're putting you through the right process of like what you would need, you know, when you get to work with an amp or a Brian. Um, so there's some learning to be had if nothing else. Um, uh, let's see, this is another email question. Maybe we could just knock this one out real quick. If sending email, how should the most effective subject line read? Is there anything that stands out um, in in subject lines? Because I'm sure both of you guys get a lot of emails. Um, um <laughs> you know, you know what? Actually, because I actually do this, so this is something I'll do when I'll send out an email. It sounds crazy, but I'll try to make it as non-traditional as possible so it doesn't look like spam because if you if you like put just a standard thing it's gonna be like oh this could be like somebody fishing but if it's like maybe in like all lower caps and then you you know like say for instance it was like uh you know for position it'd be like i make beats i looked at your website position i mean i know that sounds crazy but i'm gonna be like okay obviously somebody wrote this so i'm gonna check it out like i'm not gonna not check it out because it looks crazy i'm just i don't want to open up any fishy emails you know so i would kind of just try to make it i guess as personal as possible so it looks more real that, that's just me though gotcha yeah. and then she also asked if you can share your email again i guess i kind of did hate on that so i <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there a way for us to post it or do i have to say i that? don't want to be a hater but if you if you are comfortable you want to share it again i'm sure people would yeah would i mean you can go to our website positionmusic.com and you can find me or you can hit me at a uh, amp at position music uh dot com there you go. I don't want anybody calling me a hater after after this because <laughs> you said it twice. Uh, let's see. What's the biggest difference between a beat you want to send to an artist and a beat you want to sync for sync licensing? Because for an artist, simplicity is the key. What about sync licensing? Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, that's a good one. And I, I wish I could because you know I love talking to other producers about this because it's it's really hard, man. Like not hard to make these tracks but it's hard to understand you know what you have to do because a lot of people just don't know i mean you you have to make a dynamic track you know you have to make something that kind of has waveforms that go up and down like if you take the vocals off the track your waveforms for your track have to kind of get loud and then soft and then loud and soft because those editors need those dynamics they need cut points and stuff like that at least for right now in 2020, most artists don't want tracks like that. They just want a standard beat that's knocking and just straight. So it's hard kind of combining both worlds. The perfect scenario is to have a song that hits commercially and is extremely syncable. But that's just a really, especially for hip hop, that's just a really small gray area to go into. So <clears throat> for sync, a lot of times, and again, if this was like 10 or 15 years ago, it'd be different. But a lot of times, some of those songs just don't go that well commercially because that's just not the sound right now. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but again, I'm talking about sync for trailers and bigger forms of music. Like if you if you look at shows like Insecure, Empire, some of these other shows, they they play commercial music. So if you're if you're the lyrics in that song fit and the beat is cool, you know, you might make it on that show. Will that be as much money as making a trailer song or something that that is that, that the NFL is going to play? Probably not. But it is, you know, it's a part of sync and it's something that's there. Um, so I, I guess just quickly, I would just say you got to have dynamics. 
in your music. Um, check out Easy McCoy, Do You Know My Name? Like listen to that track, listen to how it goes. Uh, a song that gets requested so much, and I think at this point he's clearing it, is Kanye West, Black Skinhead. Mm. Like uh, yeah. listen to that track, listen to how it's dynamic. Um, Run the Jewels, Nobody Speak, that song gets picked a lot. Like you, you really <laughs> just, yeah, you, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have something that is dynamic in the track and very interesting, you know. I'm glad that you brought up nobody speak actually because um, Pulse, um, uh, like LP, is one of our writers. Yeah. So nobody speak is always the one that comes back into play often, and yeah. I'm glad that we were given references too because Black Skinhead was also really in demand as well too. And then you heard artists that were doing songs in that wheelhouse understanding how trailers work too and trailers are i'd say trailers and ads are probably the two most difficult medias i mean in terms of like um like mediums to like break into because right. it's so specific and what they're looking for is so like it, it, it's like it, it's got to hit all the check marks and i think um i think some people say well how can hip-hop be literally the biggest genre out there it's all over the charts it is mainstream mm -hmm. but like in sync it doesn't break and that is kind of one of the reasons why like sometimes the criteria is so stringent and bringing up those songs especially nobody speak i mean we just did the, um the deal with cadillac you know right. what i mean that like that's like that's now the big um that's the big song now with, with, with cadillac and um and amongst many other trailers too so it's like why does this always keep coming back so i think for you guys as independent artists um it's always good to take stock you bring up insecure like listen to the shows that well, the shows that you like the movies that you like listen to the music that you hear in there and that's how you're yeah. really going to see what's going on trend wise yeah you know, that's also a good nugget too mm -hmm. um but th the other thing too is you can also trailerize your song so you make this track for yeah, an artist. Yeah. If you want, again, if you want to get those type of syncs, you can trailerize it, you know, and and put all the the stuff in there that they need for the for those type of edits. Um, mm -hmm. The big thing, though, I would say is that track just needs to have the energy. Like I think the big thing with the Run the Jewel songs is people like the swag. They like the attitude of it because that beat is kind of consistent. But when you listen to to LP and Mike on it, it's like it's just so much mm -hmm. energy and swag on it that that's what they want. I mean, you gotta realize, man, these are big companies that want to use these songs. Mm -hmm. I probably would say the majority of some of the people choosing them don't know anything about hip hop. They don't even understand what you're saying, but they do <laughs> feel the energy. So you could say, "Got it," or you could say, "Got it." You know, and it's like they're just gonna feel the energy, and that's what they're gonna want. You know, so even if you have a consistent track, if the MC or whatever you have on it just has a swag and attitude, it it might have a chance to be picked for something that is that would fit in a trailer. I mean, it's kind of hard, but like overall, people want that that swag and that that attitude in the in the music, and that that's another thing too that kind of doesn't fit what's happening in hip hop right now. Not saying there aren't rappers out there that are more aggressive, but overall, like things are kind of mellow with uh, with the lyrics and that type of stuff, you know? So it's kind of, it's a little bit of disconnect with the sync world, not totally, but it's just like, you know, it's it's mm -hmm. kind of it's kind of difficult landing some of the big stuff with, with modern contemporary hip hop. Yeah. Do you do you think that I mean, and, and maybe you know him and actually know the answer to this, or maybe you just have an opinion? But do you think that LP knows that this? Do you think it's just the music that he makes? That's just that's just his vibe, and it just happens to fit for sync. Or does he consciously know um, him and Killer Mike? They've consciously know that if they do something a certain way, it's gonna you know satisfy <laughs> fans and be syncable. Or is it that's just their vibe and it works? I think that they've actually personally, like they know where their brand is, right? You don't see them on the Billboard chart. They they made their money in two things, touring and sync. Yeah. So they know that that's their niche and that that's that's the bread and butter. And I think 
four albums in, that's why it hasn't like it, it hasn't fallen off yet. And I think that the one that they just did, number four, is yeah. probably it may be maybe one of the best ones that they did. Yeah. Personally, you know. Yeah. Um but I mean, but that, you know, we're kind of going off subject, but that's the beauty of being mm-hmm. independent. Mm-hmm. You don't need a radio song. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we got artists on our company. You look at their Spotify and they got like 4,000 followers, but the money they make off of sync is ridiculous. I mean, like you're mm-hmm. living in a big house type of stuff in LA. You know, it's like you can make so much money just by having this as part of your brand that like it doesn't matter if you do have a commercial album or not like you you Mm -hmm. you're able to just do the music that you love you know so if you decide to do the type of hip-hop that would fit for a trailer so what you know i mean do it if you could do it successfully that could fund like a whole album of commercial hip-hop that you want to do or it could just you know it could just be just money that you're making but to me i just I can't cancel it out because it doesn't fit the 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 way hip hop sounds now. You know, I would just add it to my formula of what I'm doing now. Right. No, I mean it's 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 a great point, and it's something that I, I continue to 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 beat at home with artists. Like every artist has a different revenue mix, and I right in the beginning, like every artist has a different revenue mix, and like nothing applies to all art. Like I know I know artists that you know primarily merch. It's their merch kills it. They've done really well at you know branding a certain merch line, and that's a majority of, of their their income. Um, so I just think this education, these sessions, these platforms are so important. So you can figure out what mix works for you. You know, that's a good way of saying it. You know, because mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of different revenue streams out there. Yeah, uh, it doesn't all, right. all have to be streams, but. At the same time, I know some artists that are killing it just stream. They live off of streams alone. Um, so, you know, these conversations are important. Uh, somebody just posted, we haven't really talked much about video games. Do you guys have any yeah. experience, you know, of, of how music gets into video games and what, what that payout looks like? Um, have you? Um, yeah, go go ahead. I mean, if you, I've, I've definitely experienced it. Yeah. Um, I mean, on the creative side, more so because Madden and 2K have, and and I'll throw FIFA in that mix too, um, and Fortnite. Like those things have become now part of pop culture. Right. You know what I mean? So a lot of that now, where it used to be, um, there's still opportunities for in-game uses, no doubt. I know that they they even like to bring in collaboration. You know, like bring in artists and they'll cut custom songs for these games. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it is a pretty, it is a good revenue stream. Um, a couple, a couple of pointers. Um, pre- like from historically, the way that these things have been done, and you know what really kind of messed a lot of this up was when they started doing the rock bands and the guitar heroes, where things used to kind of be per unit, and they were like, nah, like. We cut you the big check to the companies or whatever, but they started doing things on a per song basis. So it's ultimately like a buyout that they're going to give you, whether, you know, a few grand here and there. But again, there's no sort of residual kind of thing. Like Madden can go out there and sell five, 500 million copies, but that doesn't mean additional revenue. So I just want to say that a lot of the times it does end up as being a buyout. Second of all, um, in terms of, their standards for language, they're, they they have more stringent um, language and like content sort of um, standards than like the comp- you know the people that do the albums in general. So yeah. that's even got to be cleaner than when you do like they won't even say hell in a video game. You know what I mean? So things like that. Like so, just be conscious of that too. Like you may have to go back and recut some things and like. So that that's also another thing I want to point out about video games. Can, let me uh, piggyback off of what you just said too. Again, this is kind of off subject, but we, we didn't really talk about um, profanity <clears throat> and cursing and music. Mm-hmm. This is the thing about it. Um, you, you can have some curse words, but you can't have a song 
filled with curse words because when you have to do a clean version or if you have to bleep stuff out, it's gonna sound crazy. The biggest thing though is you can't have any curse words in the hooks. So if you are doing songs that you want to use for sync and licensing, you need to either do clean versions of the hooks or you just don't put uh, curse words in there because uh, they will not get used. You know, Having a curse word here and there in your verse is okay. Sometimes it makes it more edgy, but of course you're gonna have to take that out eventually. But the first listen, you know, it might make it more believable or something like that. But overall, I would stay away from profanity uh, if you're doing music for sync and licensing. Yeah, when I when I was running my label, um, I had an artist named Jaron Benton, and I said that's one of the conversations I had with him. I was like, "Look, man, your music's dope, but if you want it to be, if you want to think opportunities, yeah, you gonna have to dial it back, you know, yeah, because it's it's tough to place that stuff. And I guess there maybe is a placement here, they like some random something on some low budget Netflix film or something. Um, yeah, but the opportunities are are pretty few and far between. Um, all right, cool, man. Well, I think, let me see if I can find one more question. Yeah, let's do some more questions, man. Let me see. I like it. Let me see. Let me see. There's just a lot of comments and people talking back and forth. <laughs> you, guys, you, cause you guys can see the, if you guys see a comment, uh, a question that, um, that looks like something we should answer. Oh, I just saw this. All right. Okay. What, what pieces of advice? Oh man, they're moving fast. You can kind of put your cursor over it and it stops it. Um, but they are, it is moving kind of fast. How should we name your music for submissions? One word. Uh, we could talk about that, like naming your songs. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much. I mean, I would, I would try to pick something that uh, maybe fits the vibe of the song. So, you know, you kind of know what you're getting into, but overall, you know, you could name it anything. If you're, if this is a song that you're putting out commercially, also, then you kind of want both worlds to meet. But like, if it's just for sync and licensing, you know, it could be called anything. You just want to make sure that it fits the vibe of the song. Got you. Okay. Anything else you guys see? Uh, questions that to pull out? Maybe we answer one or two more, and then we'll wrap it up. Can you speak to? Oh, can you speak about getting reviews and changes from clients? That's not a bad one. Um, so th this is the thing, right? You, you have a few different types of syncs that happen. You have what we call customs, and then you have uh, just kind of taking the song just as is and it fits, you know? And I, I would say this happens more with customs, of course, that you might have to go back and make some changes uh, everybody likes a song, they're going to take it, but you, you have to make these changes to make it work. I mean, I would just do what I can. I don't care how big the sync is. I would do what I can to make that work. If you have to change the song 10 times, do it. Because what, what you're not only doing is you're, you're confirming the sync and you make it hundred percent, but also you're telling the company that I'll work hard to make this work. So yeah, maybe it's a $5,000 sync. But then you might have a hundred thousand dollar one next, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna work with this guy. He'll he'll make it happen." And of course, in your head, you're like, "I'll work harder for a hundred k than five k," but you want it to feel like every time is a hundred k, you know. So, I believe, and when I've done customs, I just made it work as, as hard as it was. I mean, you're working twelve hours on a track, you know. You just make it work. It just it helps build relationships, you know. Yeah. Please take take your ego out of this process. Like, oh man, take your yeah. ego out of this yeah. process. Check it at the door. Because sometimes cats won't do certain things. It's like, yeah, you are not like so. A sink might be, let's say, ten thousand dollars. Ain't nothing you guys are doing right now that you getting to pay ten thousand. <laughs> Whatever they ask, like just make the change. It, it, it's better, like Amp said, for the long term benefit of the, the relationship as you become easy to work with, you know, and they yeah. might be getting on your nerves and they be, might be asking for all these changes. But in the long scheme of things, it's worth it. And, you know, this opportunity could compensate you, you know, to a degree yeah, that you haven't compensated before, right? Um, so, relationships so are key. 
That's a whole other yeah. subject, but man, relationships yeah. are key. Relationships don't want to drive it all. Yeah. yeah. It, yep. And oh. and all it takes is one. All it takes, oh, it takes is one, one bad either. experience. It With really the wrong does. person, then they get on the email yep. on the phone like, man, I just, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. It's all that. And it and it's not really a different topic. I mean, I think relationship that's that's a topic that is a part of every topic, right? No matter what we're talking about, I think it's important to you know address networking and and keeping solid relationships. So, um, I well, see another good question about the ideal length for submitted tracks. Can we answer that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say two and a half to three minutes. I wouldn't submit a five minute track. Um, but again, this is this is for this isn't for like if you're doing trailer music or scores or that type of thing. This is just for like standard songs. I would do like two and a half, three, three and a half minutes at the most. Um, I mean, we're, they're gonna use probably like 15 seconds of a song if it gets synced, so not not too long. Right. Cool. And then actually, I I mean, I would also say too, but Amp, you jump in on this as well. I don't know if you want to necessarily and again it's keeping it short for a reason but even like because a lot of this is hook driven even identifying where the hook is on the track just mm. so even if they got to speed up and get to the point where they want to hear the hook yeah. um because some are listening for the beat some are listening for the for the hook just to see if there's anything in there so again remember it's just not everybody's got they're not going to have the attention span to sit there and listen to the whole track yeah. so like you said sure. you, you got to give them what they need yeah so yeah. great advice well i mean I, I i thought this conversation was awesome i'm sure people got a lot out of it um amp brian thank you for joining us today um i know i'm instructed not to close out this broadcast i think i'm just going to remove you guys from the stream unless you guys just want to, to let people know how to find you if you're on instagram i don't know if you guys are on social like that yeah but feel free to let people know you know where where they can connect with you uh you can check me out on instagram amp lives world a m p l i v e s world uh same thing on TikTok. you can always hit me at amp at position music.com if you want to give me submissions and beats or even if you have any questions you know so hit me up so oh. cool yeah and um i'm my email is brian b-r-i-a-n at pulsemusicgroup.com um i just want to just say a word or two just before uh jumping off um and i guess if it's some last words um there's some artists that do well with touring and you know this is now an opportunity for a lot of people to do well with sync and i think we we all kind of touched on it to some degree but take this expectation you know out your head that you know that like this is what i gotta look like as an artist and i gotta i gotta be selling out the rose bowl or madison square garden because that's only really for a small amount of people and i'm not saying that that is this is not about the current dreams but this thing is like this side of the business can be so lucrative and if you really dig in and if you really put in and you really grind it could really really take you places yeah and i just i don't want anybody to fade like you know for what we all know about music we all know one side but i want you to see that this side of it can be very lucrative there are people out there that started out as artists and they they weren't making it they weren't charting they weren't but they found a way to make it happen and now they're actually doing well for themselves and when i say make a living i mean like making good good money yeah. doing this now and it could take you, it could take you so many different places, you yeah. know, film um, side, advertising side, TV side. So, you know, don't fade any of it, but that, those, those are kind of my, my closing remarks and I'll let Amp uh, wrap up too. Yeah, I, man, that you, you really, there's a whole other conversation, but you, you guys have to be patient. Like that's the one thing mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get clear. Sync and licensing, you don't submit the track and then you get paid next month. Like it is a process. So please enter this and knowing that if you do get a big placement, like it's gonna take a while for you to finally get paid because the the money has to be transferred in so many different places for you to finally get paid. But it's, it's kind of like you're you're in a forest and you're planting seeds for trees. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna plant the seed, and you're gonna come back two years later, and it's gonna be this huge tree. You know, you might have forgotten about the beat, 
But once that money starts rolling in, it doesn't stop. Your publishing keeps on going, everything keeps on moving. So it's, it's kind of a patience waiting game. You know, be patient with doing this, do as much music as possible, and just know that like, it's gonna take a while, but once it starts, it, uh, you know, it kind of keeps going. You know, this is something that I believe needs to be part of everybody's brand. There's, there's at the most maybe nine to 10 ways to get paid in music, period. And sync and licensing should be one of them, whether it's a small piece of the pie or a huge one, like it should be something, you know, because you never know what this song is gonna do. One song could make you $200,000 for that whole year because it got synced 20 times, you know? Mm. And so you don't want to count that out of your your uh, revenue. For sure. 